Good evening, everyone. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for this peculiar church that you have given us, where we are united by our common form of prayer around the world. Come and be with us as we study that form of prayer. Guide us and inspire us as you've promised to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, welcome back to everyone um, who, um, Jim, maybe a little lower, please. Thank you. <clears throat> welcome back. For those of you who missed session three because of the rescheduling, we are on session four tonight. Session four, which is liturgy, how we worship. For those of you who were here in session three, you'll know that I introduced a sort of crazy concept that the Episcopal Church and our Anglican brothers and sisters throughout the world are united not by a common statement of belief, but by a common form of prayer. Let me unpack that a little bit. When we were here uh, at session three, I said to you, now, someone's going to say to you, the Episcopal Church, that's that church that was formed when? Henry VIII, because he divorced his first wife, or he wanted to divorce his first wife. And what I said to you then was, when someone says that terrible thing to you, you should say, that's part of the story, but not the whole of the story. Because the whole of the story is, England was a Catholic country, Henry having been declared by the Pope defender of the faith, and we're going to come back to that a little bit later tonight, declares that England is a Protestant country, appoints his own Archbishop of Canterbury, outlaws Catholicism, and goes about killing all the Catholics. His daughter, by his first wife, is sent into exile. She lives as a Roman Catholic. And then when Henry dies and his son Edward dies, she comes to power as Queen Mary I, she is a Roman Catholic. She outlaws Protestantism in England. It goes about killing all the Protestants. So we've now gone from being a Catholic country to Catholicism being illegal to Catholicism being the law. Well, then Queen Mary I dies, and her half-sister becomes Queen Elizabeth I. And what's it's her turn to do now, right? Kill all the Catholics. But she doesn't. Instead, Elizabeth I realizes that what is important to the Catholics is their liturgy, the particular way that they worship, and what's important to the Protestants is their theology, the particular things that they believe about the Bible, about salvation through grace, not through works. And so what she realizes is that if she takes the Protestant theology and lays a Catholic liturgy on top of it, she might just create a church in which all English people could worship together. In short, Elizabeth I, it was her turn to kill everybody who disagreed with her, and she chose not to. I told you that wonderful passage uh, from our Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane when the Roman soldiers come into the garden and Peter draws out his sword and cuts off the right ear of the guard and Jesus says to him, what? Put away your sword. Put away your sword. And Elizabeth I put away her sword. I'm dying for that, that passage to come up in the lectionary so that I can preach on it because frankly, I think that piece of scripture is the hope of the world. I know that it's your turn to retaliate. I know that it's your turn to call people who disagree with you names. I know that it's your turn to change the rules of the government to suit your party because the other party did it first. I know all of that. But somebody has got to put away their sword. And that for us was Elizabeth I. And perhaps in our world it can be us. That is the story of the Anglican Church. A Protestant theology with a Catholic liturgy laid over top of it, and a book that describes this strange and wondrous thing that is called the Book of Common Prayer, the Book of Prayer that is common to all English people. That's our heritage. 
That was session three. Today in session four, we're going to unpack what this, um, what this book means and what this book is to us. It's the red book that sits in the prayer ra- prayer pew racks in front of you. Um, and there really are, we always start on 355 or 328, depending on whether you come to the 8 o'clock service or the 1030 service. There are like a thousand pages in that book. It's, it's awesome. We only use like 30 of them, but it's a, a great book. We begin with a word from the cliche police. The family that prays together stays together. That is the Anglican church in a nutshell. Since we pray together, we stay together. We might disagree on particular matters of theology. We might have different cultural traditions. We might speak different languages. But we pray together, so we stay together. Well, that doesn't sound quite like us. You know, when something needs to sound fancy in the Episcopal Church, you know what we, what we do, right? We translate it into Latin and then throw it at you. So, um, for example, that section of the Eucharist that's called Sanctus et Benedictus, right? And David will always put it in the, in the liturgy, Sanctus et Benedictus. It's that passage that says, holy, 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 blessed is he, and then blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Translate holy into Latin, it's Sanctus. Translate blessed into Latin, it's Benedictus. Sanctus et Benedictus. We took the first word, translated them into Latin, and made it sound like it was a fun title. <laughs> we do the same thing with the Agnus Dei. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Lamb, God, Agnus Dei. Just translate it into Latin, throw it right back at you. No problem. So let me translate this into Latin and throw it right back at you. Lex orandi, lex credendi. Can anybody help me with the translation, please? How you pray is how you believe. Can anyone do it literally for me? The law of prayer is the law of belief. The law of prayer is the law of belief. Or as one particular liturgical theologian put it, Our praying shapes our believing. Our praying shapes our believing. It's that idea that we're united by that common form of prayer rather than by adherence to a specific doctrinal statement. That makes the church a messy place because people will come and say, well, what do Episcopalians believe? Well, Delia thinks this, I think that, Zach thinks the other thing, and that's actually true. We don't always agree because we're united by our prayer and not by a doctrinal statement. So let's talk about that prayer. Everything that the Anglican form of prayer has is cyclical. It's cyclical. And I want to underscore that because you don't have to worry about what's going to happen when you come in on Sunday morning. In uh, some traditions, the pastor has to rewrite the prayers every week. I don't have that in me. I, I don't have that many prayers in me. And if I have a bad day when I'm standing up there with my arms out like this, you're getting a bad prayer. Not in the Episcopal Church. You're going to get a beautiful prayer every single time. But in order to keep it moving, we have these rhythms. If you want to think about it, the form of prayer that we have becomes like a stream, and it keeps running. And maybe we dip into it here, maybe we ride in it for a little bit, maybe we dip into it over here. But the form of prayer is that um, rolling, rolling stream. We divide our prayers and our uh, calendar, uh, our annual calendar, our annual cycle, by two key dates. What do you suppose are the key dates in a church calendar. Christmas and Easter. I love it. This is wonderful. See, you know that I was anticipating this when the slide is ready to show it to you right away. Christmas and Easter. What day is Christmas, please? December 25th. That was not a trick question. That's exactly correct. December 25th. Um, Interesting aside, um, I was attending a wedding once And uh, the couple who was getting married uh, made a big deal about their wedding being on the fifth day of Christmas. And they were talking about golden rings and things like that. Got there and the preacher at the wedding gave this long sermon about how it was the sixth day of Christmas. (laughs) 
was unfortunate for them. Um, just so we all know, the first day of Christmas is Christmas Day, not Christmas Eve. So if you're going to count the 12 days, you want to start on Christmas Day, not on Christmas Eve. So we have Christmas Day on December 25th, and then we have Easter Day. And who knows the formula for Easter Day? Yes. 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 25% off your annual pledge right there. You got that. Very, very good. So you take the vernal equinox and you go forward to the next full moon and you go forward to the next Sunday and that's Easter. Does anybody uh, notice that Easter seems to be a little bit late this year? Do you know why? There was a full moon on the vernal equinox. And so when you go from the vernal equinox to the next full moon, it was a whole moon cycle. And that hit early in a week, and then you had to go forward to the next Sunday. That's why Easter moves around, because it's following the lunar calendar, not the solar calendar. So we've got Easter, vernal equinox to the full moon to Easter. And we've got those two anchor points in the calendar. And then we're going to build in a few other days. What do you suppose might be the other days that we need to anchor the calendar? Just shout them out to me. Pentecost. Pentecost. Epiphany. Epiphany. Ash Wednesday. Good Friday. Advent. All Saints, All Saints actually, All Saints should govern the calendar, and it doesn't, but it's, um, it's a very good idea. So here's what we've got. You take Christmas Day, and you fast forward, actually, let's back up. So you take Christmas Day, and you back up four Sundays, and that gives you the season of Advent. In Advent, we are preparing for the arrival of Christ. So if you take Christmas as the anchor point, you back up four weeks, and that gives you your season of preparation for Christmas. Christmas lasts how long? I've already given it to you. Not a trick question. On the first day of Christmas, my true love gave to me da, 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 five golden rings. Bum, bum. You all know the song. I won't go any further. Twelve days of Christmas, which leads us to what? Count it on your fingers if you need to. January 6th. So the twelfth day of Christmas is January 5th. The first day of the next season is the Feast of the Epiphany, which is on January 6th. And then it, the uh, Feast of the Epiphany marks the arrival of the wise men at the, um, uh, at, in Bethlehem. The arrival of the wise men in Bethlehem. How many wise men were there? We don't know. This is great. I'm so proud of you. This is just wonderful. We are told in the Scripture that the wise men come from the east. And we are told in the scripture that the wise men come bearing gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, but we don't get a one-to-one -one correlation. It could have been a whole bunch of wise guys with three different kinds of gifts. It could have been, it's plural, so we know there were at least two. Um, it could have been two wise guys, one of whom had to juggle two different gifts to get it there. All this is possible. We don't know. Scripture doesn't tell us. Tradition has given us that part. Now, the interesting part about the Epiphany story is that we mark it as having uh, 12, days to, 12 days having passed in the Scripture as much as two years might have passed because Herod goes and has the babies killed and he has all of them killed who are under two years old. So it could have been that it took them two years to follow that star. But Epiphany is all about light shining in darkness so we're going to hear about stars, we're going to hear about light, um, and we're going to have Epiphany for a good long while. We're going to have Epiphany to Ash Wednesday, but let me figure out Ash Wednesday first because it's not quite as easy. How do we calculate Ash Wednesday? Six weeks. Let's be a little more precise. Forty days. Forty days. That is completely wrong. Absolutely wrong. It is 40 days, not counting Sundays. That's right. So if you go to your calendar and you start on Easter Day and you back up 40 days, you're not going to hit Ash Wednesday. Sundays are not included because Sundays are the Feast of the Resurrection. 
And even in our penitential season, we are not going to stop being people of the resurrection. Now, that means whatever you gave up, you get a pass on Sundays. But I'm not giving you a pass at church because if we didn't do Lent on Sundays in church, we would never do Lent. So we're going to do Lent on Sundays in church. But if you are making a 40-day commitment from Ash Wednesday to Easter, you get Sundays off. Little present for you. Little present for you. So for Ash Wednesday... For Ash Wednesday, we start at Easter Day, and we count back 40 days less Sundays, and that'll always put you on a Wednesday, and that's Ash Wednesday. I'm going to come back to this in a second. Then we have Lent, not Lent, that's in the dryer, Lent is in the church, which goes from Ash Wednesday to Easter Day. And then what about that Pentecost thing? Pentecost is the gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And how are we going to calculate Pentecost? Sorry again? Are you sure? Are you sure? You were right to start. It's 50 days. Easter season, I'm, I'm getting there. Don't jump ahead of me. The Easter season lasts from Easter Day to Pentecost, 50, the great 50 days of Easter. Think about it, Pentecost, P-E-N-T-E, 50, that's the root in there, so it has to be 50 days, 50 days. And if you'd like to think about it this way, the season of resurrection says to the season of penitence, I see your 40 days and I raise you 10 more. <laughs> Our season of joy and rejoicing is longer than our season of penitence and fasting. Sundays do count. Sundays do count. So then, we don't have anything else until Advent. All of the fun stuff is loaded in the front half of the calendar. So from the Feast of Pentecost, the day of Pentecost, all the way through to the Sunday before Advent 1, We are in what's called creatively the season after Pentecost. Those of you who are coming over from the Roman Catholic Church will know the season after Pentecost and the Epiphany season as ordinary time. Ordinary time because they are so ordinary. They make up more than half the year. All the fun stuff happening in that little wedge at the beginning of the year. The season of Pentecost lasts until the Sunday before Advent 1, which is called Christ the King. Christ the King. Our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters will recognize this as well. Uh, The season of Christ the King was uh, created by one of the popes in the 1920s to reassert the lordship of Christ over the sort of fascist powers that we're starting to build. And so an edict from the pope in the 20th century impacts the Protestant calendar to this day. An edict from the pope in the 20th century, impacts the liturgical calendar to this day for the Protestants. Why? Because we thought it was a jolly good idea. And so we stuck it into. And you need some holiday out there. We've just gone all the way from Pentecost to, um, to Advent without very much in between. And then once you arrive at Christ the King, you go forward a week and you're into... Advent, and then you go forward four weeks and you're into, and then you go forward 12 days and you're into, and then you go forward to Ash Wednesday, and then you've got, wait a minute, Ash Wednesday, Lent, Lent, don't forget it, it's short, we trump it, but we're still going to do it. Uh, We have 40 days, less Sundays of Lent, then we have 50 days of Easter, then we have 24 or 5 weeks of Pentecost, and then we start it all over again. And we start it all over again. And we model what our, what our world is doing, what God's creation is doing. We start in the wintertime, which is a season of expectation. And then we have the coming of Christ while things are still dark. 
And then we move into the springtime season when things start to just come out and be reconciled and new life starts to emerge. And then we get this grand explosion in the springtime where we talk about new life and abundance and wonderfulness and joy. And then we settle in for a long period when it's just late spring and summer and fall, the period of growth and leading us to harvest. This is what the world does. This is what the good earth does. And so this is what we do too. Okay, are we good with the yearly form, the yearly rhythm? Okay, so we've got a yearly rhythm and that's rolling along. And if you are one of those people who wants to say that regular church attendance is three times a year, this is going to help you out so that you can sort of make a, make a spot. Did you know that in the Episcopal Church, the definition of a member in good standing until recently was a member on the rolls, which means you're baptized and officially registered, a financial gift, and attendance at worship three times in the course of the year, which meant Easter and Christmas wasn't enough, but if you threw one more in, you're good. <laughs> We're trying to raise the bar on you just a little bit from there. That's a, that's a low threshold, low threshold. So let's say for a moment that you don't want to do your devotion once a year or a couple of times a year. The prayer book gives you the idea of daily devotion. And so the idea is that your day is going to be framed by prayer, and each one of those days is going to spin around, and then those days are going to spin into seasons, and we're just going to go around the sun making a big orbit and making revolutions on our axis. Again, mimicking our form of prayer to what the world is doing around us. And so we get the daily regimen of prayer, which is still preserved in our prayer book. Morning prayer. Good morning, Lord. Thank you for this beautiful day. Please strengthen me as I approach this day that I might do your will. Noonday prayer. Almighty God, I'm halfway through. Did you see those emails that I was getting today? Can you believe that that person won't leave me alone until I can do my work? Can you believe it? How did they make that decision? Do you know how much money we lost? Noonday prayer, refocusing. Bring us back, remember the values of the faith. Evening prayer is coming to the close of that time. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for what happened in this day. Give me the strength to leave behind those things that didn't get done today. Give me the ability to go home and be present to my family. Give me whatever rhythm I need that I might be healthy and strong. And then the nighttime prayers are the ones that you say when you're going to bed, calling a close to that and asking God to settle your mind and your heart so that you can sleep and so that you can wake up the next morning and thank God for the beautiful day and ask his blessing on all the things you're going to do and start the cycle all over again. Vespers is one of the offices that came out of the monastic tradition. This is the balance. And for those of us who do not live in a monastic community, who do have jobs and grocery stores and all of those things that we need to attend to, we're invited to a fourfold form of prayer, starting the day, in the midst of the day, at the end of the day, before sleep. The monks, if you go and visit any of our Anglican monasteries, and there are several of them, uh, the, I think the one that I'm most connected with is in West Park, New York. It's beautiful, nestled on the edge of the Hudson, uh, just below West Point. Um, they, are, um, they still pray on that schedule. And I tell you, if you're talking to one of those brothers and the bell rings, he's getting up and walking out. So the idea is this daily rhythm of prayer. The readings are going to change that are appointed. The prayers are going to change. They're not going to change week by week, but they're going to change season by season. In this church, um, you'll notice that our Eucharistic prayer and our prayers of the people change season by season. So the words that we use on Sunday morning at the table will change season by season. Right now, I think we're in prayer A, if I'm not mistaken. When we get into Eastertide, we're going to turn into prayer B. Those of you who didn't like a prayer C, which is the one that has all of your responses back that's kind of hard to do, and the one that talks about this fragile earth, our island home, and interstellar space, the galaxies, suns, and planets and their courses, you remember that one? Did that seem like it was a little long this year? The reason that felt long is because Easter was late, which meant that Epiphany was long. All right, so this is the inheritance that we get from Elizabeth I and the Tudors. 
the gift that they gave to us of finding a way for people to live together and pray together rather than kill each other. But then, remember this was also formed during the Reformation. Um, But he offered us this idea, Ecclesia Reformata Semper Reformanda. Ecclesia Reformata Semper Reformanda. Can someone help me with the translation? Yes, you're on it, Lori. Okay, let's do it together. Ecclesia, church. Reformata, reformed, very good. Semper, always. Reformanda, related to reformed again. The church reformed is always reforming. The church reformed is always reforming. Why is that important for the Protestants? They've just risked their lives in a very literal way to say that the dogmatic teachings of the Roman Catholic Church were wrong. And what they didn't want to do was set up a whole new church that would, over over the years, develop its own dogmas that couldn't be violated. If you think about the three-legged stool from our theology class, what were the three legs? Scripture, tradition, reason. Scripture, tradition, reason. If we're sitting on all three of those legs, the reason one is going to change things. It's going to unstabilize the stool just a little bit, and we're going to have to correct for that. And when our reason has an insight that it had not had before, the tradition is going to have to change. And what Martin Luther says is that's going to keep happening, and it's a good thing. It's a good thing. Not all wisdom was revealed to the apostles. In fact, Jesus says so in John. I have so much more to teach you, but you can't handle it now. And so, it stands to reason that there is going to be more revelation as the church goes along. Sometimes that's going to be a new opportunity that's revealed to us. Sometimes it's going to be a sin that we didn't know we were committing. And those are the harder ones. We had a reform movement in the uh, 1960s and 70s. It went across the Christian church, uh, the Western Christian church. Um, Everybody who is coming over from the Roman Catholic Church will say, oh, Vatican II, right? Oh, Vatican II, either yay, Vatican II, or I can't believe that they want us not to worship in Latin, right? So Vatican II was the Roman Catholics' exploration of the liturgical reform movement of the middle part of the 20th century. We over in the Protestant Church had the same one. Who in the room remembers morning prayer days? What was morning prayer? Sunday morning. No communion, first Sunday of the month, right? Three Sundays out of the month. So you had communion on the first Sunday, and then you had morning prayer the other Sundays, right? Well, that didn't actually make a lot of sense because morning prayer is part of that daily regimen that's supposed to spin us around. But in the Episcopal Church, you'd only receive communion once a month, and it would be morning prayer all the rest of the days. Now, those who've been around a while miss those canticles because they're just beautiful. But the liturgical reform movement said, no, we need to be sacramentally centered. You have an obligation to say morning prayer every day and to have that daily rhythm of prayer. But when we gather as the church corporate, we need to celebrate the Lord's Supper. Why? Because Jesus told us to. So in 1979, the Episcopal Church issued a new prayer book. It actually came out in 76 and was ratified in 79. Many people thought this to be rank heresy, but there we go. We got a new prayer book. And it is sacramentally focused. So the two centerpieces of the book are the two great sacraments of the church, baptism and Eucharist. Baptism is entrance into the church and membership in the body of Christ. Membership in the church means being baptized, period, paragraph. Membership in the church means being baptized. If you have been baptized somewhere else, I can receive you onto the rolls of this church because we're only going to baptize you once. But if you haven't been baptized, you may not join this church unless you are baptized. Um, We believe, if you look at those little italic um, words, look at those little italic words in the prayer book, um, you'll see that we believe the, the, the the bond which God establishes in baptism is indissoluble. The bond which God establishes in baptism is indissoluble. Not the bond that you create by getting baptized 
or that I create by officiating at the baptism, but the bond that God Himself made with you is indissoluble. In other words, you may walk away from God, but God will never, ever walk away from you. That's the promise of baptism. We're not going to redo it because we don't believe that God ever gave up. There are two occasions on which I have, quote, rebaptized someone who had been baptized in another tradition, and it was over our understandings of God. One was a Jehovah's Witness, one was a Mormon, and they had been baptized in those traditions but had a very different understanding of what that meant. If you come to me as a Catholic, if you come to me as a Presbyterian, if you come to me as a Baptist, and you say, I was baptized, I'm going to say, amen, welcome. That's, that's how it works. It doesn't need to be redone. So, the Reformers put baptism and Eucharist right smack in the middle, the rite of entry and the weekly rite by which we remember Jesus, and then they stacked up books on either side. In this direction, we start where? With the daily office, the daily rhythm of prayer. So, if you open up the prayer book and get past the sort of front matter, you'll see we arrive right at the daily rhythm of prayer. We start every day with prayer. So you can just open up your prayer book literally to the first meaty section, and you'll be ready to start your daily rhythm. Then we've got baptism and Eucharist. Well, what leads us to baptism and to Eucharist? It's that annual cycle, right? And so in between the daily prayers and between and the entry of people into the church, we have all of the special days. So we have the rite for Ash Wednesday, then we have the rite for Monday Thursday, or for Palm Sunday, then Monday Thursday, then Good Friday, then Easter Vigil. All the things that we need to lead us towards baptism, which is membership in the church, and then on to Eucharist, which is our weekly observance of Christ. Does that make sense? So you get your daily form. Then you get your sequence of events that lead us to the Easter Vigil, which is the time when converts to the faith were baptized and welcomed into the faith. And then you get the Eucharist, which is the meal shared by those who share the faith. And then you get on to these other things over here. The pastoral are things that I will administer for you, okay? So daily office is you. On your own, you don't need me for that. The pastoral offices are the things that you need for me to do, and they are arranged in order of life sequence. So, confirmation, marriage, birth of a child, reconciliation of sins, prayers for sick people, uh, prayers at the time of death, funerals. And you'll notice how those are arranged in life sequence. Confirmation, um, then um, marriage, then having a child, then being sick. Then, et cetera, et cetera. If you look at the um, if you look at the sequence in your prayer book table of contents, you'll notice that the rite of confession, private confession, so you seeking reconciliation with God over your sins, comes immediately after the rite celebrating the birth of a child. So once you have your kids, we figure that you're going to have some things you need to confess. So we stick that right in the line: marriage, birth of a child, confession of sins. Right, in, right, all set up in a line. You get them in the order that you need them. And then we get sickness, time of death, and funerals, all lined up in a row. There are also things where we mark liturgically the phases of life. When you move from childhood to uh, young adulthood, we mark that with confirmation. When you move from singleness to uh, marriedness, we mark that with marriage. When you move from being uh, dinks, double income, no kids, to having your children and starting your family in that way, we mark that with the rite of celebration of the birth of a child. We put in a rite in the 1979 prayer book for the adoption of a child. Then we move from that to confessing your sins. Then we start acknowledging that you might get sick as you get older. And then we move into you're going to have a time of death as you get older. And then we move into how are we going to celebrate your resurrection. And then this last section here, Episcopal offices, are things that you need a bishop for. Things you need a bishop for. And those are installing a new priest as the head of your congregation, ordination of deacons, priests, and bishops. This is you on your own. Um, those of you who will seek to make vows in front of the bishop, either being confirmed or received into this communion or re reaffirming your baptismal vows, will be given a prayer book um, at your, from us. That's your present. 
Um, you can also look at any of the ones in the pews. You can order them online. Um, but it's just good to get to know all the stuff. Just tucked over here is the calendar so that you can figure out that yearly cycle. And then after, after this is some really helpful information, some historical documents, and all of the Psalms tucked in here because you need the Psalms to do your daily stuff. So we stuck them in the back so you didn't have to carry two books around. All right, we good with the prayer book? This is the 79 book. What was the book that preceded it? 28. And we all go, oh. People will still say to this day, when did that new prayer book come in? Well, it's older than me, but that's all right. We'll just, we'll just leave that aside. You can get it on Kindle. You can also go to bcponline.org, and it has it um, all indexed on the left-hand margin. Um, so it's, it's out there. It's open sourced. Ironically, the prayer book is open sourced such that anybody can have it and anybody can use it. The Bible translations are copyrighted. So the Bible's copyrighted, but the prayer book's open. The 79 book gave us a modular design, a modular design, and this is important to understanding what we do on Sunday morning. Here's my choo-choo train. A choo-choo train has, those of you who have small children are like, oh yeah, I'm getting this, I'm getting this. The choo-choo train has an engine and cars. And on Sunday mornings, the en engine is the liturgy of the Word. What do you suppose the liturgy of the Word is on Sunday mornings? Which parts of the service? I've already told you it's at the beginning. So the lessons, right? The first prayers. Uh, then we're going to hear the sermon, yet more words. After the sermon, we're going to say the creed, yet more words. Then we're going to say our prayers and confess our sins, all this word stuff. No tactile objects involved in this. It's all just a lot of words. And then what do you suppose is the liturgy of the table? Communion, right? So the first half of the service is all words, and the second half of the service has all the toys. So we have the chalice and the patent and the book, and we have wine, and we have bread, and we have oil to the thing, and we're going to move around. We're going to come up. We're going to do the stuff. What's halfway? The passing of the peace. Now, two ways to think about this. One, theological. In the liturgy of the word, we come in from the world. We come in carrying all of our sins, all of the regrets, all of the guilt, all of the stuff. We are inspired by God's holy word. We are inspired by the fine preachers who occupy our pulpit. We say our prayers to God for the world and for ourselves. Most importantly, we ask God's forgiveness of all the stuff that we brought into the church with us. And then we receive the absolution of a priest. And we believe that when you receive the absolution of a priest, your sins are separated from you as far as the east is from the west, so says the Scripture. And in that moment, you are fully reconciled with God. And so in that moment, we ask you to go and see the other people in the church and shake their hand to say we are reconciled with each other. We have just been forgiven of our sins. We are in right relationship with God. And I choose to go around to my neighbors and say, I'm reconciled with you, Vicki. No enmity exists between us. I'm going to look you in the eye and shake your hand to show that we are reconciled. And when we are reconciled, then and only then are we invited to approach the altar of God. God does not seek to receive us with our grudges in our hearts and saying, well, I don't want to stand next to Lee because she did this thing at work this week. We do the reconciliation and the inspiration in the first part, and then together we approach the altar of God, and we do it literally. Over here, we hear the words, and we say the prayers, and we ask the forgiveness, and then literally, with each other, we approach the altar of God. But let's say we're doing a baptism or a wedding or uh, an ordination, May 4th, the ordination of the bishop. What we're going to do is take off the Liturgy of the Word and put on something else. We take off the Liturgy of the Word <laughs> and we slide on the special thing that we're doing. Most of these are going to get drawn out of those other sections of the prayer book, right? So if we have a baptism... We chop off the usual liturgy of the Word, throw that away for the day, and pop on the liturgy of baptism. If our job that day is to do confirmation, no problem. We'll chop off the liturgy of the Word and slide on confirmation. 
If we're going to ordain somebody, it's no problem at all. We'll chop off the liturgy of the Word, slide on an ordination. Want to get married in the church? That's no problem at all. Slide off the liturgy of the Word, slide on the liturgy of marriage. Interesting point, though. The second half doesn't change. So on those baptismal days, when you walk in and you see the baptismal font in the middle of the church with flowers everywhere, and you're like, oh, goodness, I forgot it was a baptismal day. I would have stayed home. Don't ever do that. Please don't ever do that. That's ridiculous. Don't ever do that. But when you do that, possibly, maybe never, you need to know the second half is just the same. It's just the same. And the first half of the liturgy is really like three or four minutes longer. You can survive it, I promise. This was an innovation of the 1979 book. We didn't have this before. Questions about the modular form of the liturgy? Excellent question. What if you want to get married and you don't want to have communion? What if you want to have a funeral and you don't want to have communion? We can handle that. Um, That is similar to a train engine running down the tracks without its caboose, right? It can stand on its own. Um, You can see, however, if you look at the theology of it, why that becomes incomplete. Because it's that first part that's creating something new, honoring resurrection, creating reconciliation between people. And the invitation is in that place of newness that we're creating over here to then approach the altar of God together. Um, I did a wedding here on uh, Saturday evening last. Uh, We had, I think, 350 guests. I mean, it was a very large wedding. Uh, We had 34 people in the bridal party. Uh, all kind of up there on the platform. It was, it was a very large wedding. Um, and this couple decided that they wanted communion. And people were saying, oh my gosh, how could you ever possibly? It's no trouble. We administer communion to that many people every Sunday. It's no big deal at all. Um, so we went through the first half of the liturgy, in this case a wedding, not a baptism. We got them married. We said our prayers. We blessed them. We acknowledged our right relationship with each other. And then we went to the table. Had it been a funeral, I would have said, uh, so-and-so's family has invited you to join them in finding solace at God's table. Had it been a baptism, um, this, we invite you to join us in the spirit of newness in remembering the promises of Christ. We approach the table together. Do this in remembrance of me. That's right. We, it's a, a general confession rather than an individual confession. So we together are confessing our sins together together. And then I, as the priest, am pronouncing a general absolution over all those sins. It's a, it's a different approach, but we also offer private confession, which I'm going to come back to in a second. The Roman Catholic model is that everybody individually has to sit with the priest and get their individual absolution first, and that's a variance. That's a variance. The Great Litany is a, a form of prayer that can kind of get substituted in. Um, that's, I'm not going to go into detail on that, but it's inserted in, the, um, it's inserted in that first part for question is, are there any times when we do not do communion uh, every Sunday in church? Um, In the Episcopal Church, prior to 1980, pretty regularly it was not communion. So this is all new. Uh, This is within my lifetime, a shift for this church. Um, The only day of uh, the calendar that we don't celebrate the Eucharist is Good Friday um, and Holy Saturday. We believe that God is absent from us at that time, and we're sort of memorializing what that would be like. So, but that only lifts us up to higher levels of joy on Easter Day when we, when we fix it up. All right, let's talk about sacraments for a minute. This is a phrase that if you want to be um, an Episcopalian and everybody, you want everybody to know that you're an Episcopalian uh, and so that you can be prideful about being an Episcopalian, you need to memorize this phrase. A sacrament is, a sacrament is an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. Let's unpack that a little bit. So for us, a sacrament cannot be you having a private moment with Jesus. It's not a bad thing to have a private moment with Jesus, but it's not a sacrament. A sacrament is outward and visible. The sacraments usually, not exclusively, but usually are conducted within the community of the church. For example, that wedding that I did that I was telling you about, if you'd wanted to come, doors open, come on in. Reception's a different matter. That's, you know, people are paying for that and all, all the things. But the wedding service itself, we don't have private services at Holy Communion. If somebody's having a funeral, come on. In fact, that's a really nice thing to do when you see those funeral announcements. If you're free just to come 
Um, sometimes the funerals can be quite small because people outlived most of their friends. Uh, there's a woman in this church, and I'm inspired by her every time I see her. Um, when she was on the vestry, Reynolds Cheney, my predecessor three back, said to her, vestry members should go to all the funerals. And ever since, she's gone to every funeral when she's been in town. It's a beautiful thing. It doesn't matter to me if I was close to you. You're one of God's children, and you're going home, and I'm going to stay here and say my prayers with you, as we would hope anybody would do for us. But all services are public. It's an outward sign. If we're doing one of these sacramental actions, you're welcome to come. And there are going to be lines in the service where you, as the community, are going to be asked to give your endorsement and promise that you're going to support and promise that you're going to help. Um, when we celebrate baptisms coming up on Easter, we're going to say, will all of you witnessing these promises do all in your power to support these persons in their life in Christ? And you're going, we will. And then I'm going to say, no, no, will you do it? And you're going to say, yes, we will. And then I'm going to tell you that you actually have to. That these people are no longer parenting solo because they got 400 people who just made a promise on behalf of like a billion people around the world. So, sacraments, how many are there? I got two. I got seven. Do I have anybody else who wants to get into this argument with me? Jonathan, put your hand down. <laughs> Let's stick with the two for a moment. Uh, does anybody want to suggest what they might be? Baptism and Eucharist. This is excellent. You're remembering back to a few slides ago. Baptism and Eucharist. We are going to call these, because we need a fancy Latin word, remember back to the beginning of the class, we're going to call these the dominical sacraments, deriving from the word dominus, which means God. Godly, God-powerful, that, that sort of thing. And we're going to call these the two dominical sacraments because they're the ones that God did. When Jesus came and lived among us, He got baptized and He did the Last Supper and he told us to do what he did at the Last Supper. I forgot to do the inward grace side. Does that make sense, though, that it's your spiritual stuff, that experience that you're having, but it's a visible marker of it? So it needs to have the visible marker, and it has to have the warm fuzzy. So we've got two dominical sacraments, baptism and Eucharist. And then we have five disputed sacraments, lesser sacraments, so-called sacraments deriving from the corrupt practices of the apostles, as some of our historical documents like to call them. We've got these five things that seem awfully sacrament-like, but weren't done by Jesus, so we're not quite sure what to do with them, and they're those life moment ones. Can we walk through those? Do you think we can come up with all five? Confirmation, marriage, holy orders, which is ordination, Start again. Last rites, uh, extreme unction is the technical name, and reconciliation of a penitent. Confirmation, ordination, marriage, penance, unction. This is last rites, healing prayers at the time of death. Penance is individual confession that we were talking about a moment ago. And um, that's something in the Episcopal Church, we got another little catchy phrase um, for around private confession. All may, none must, some should. And that's that Protestant ideal, right? So the Catholic part of our liturgy, which matters to the Catholics, is saying we have to have a place where I can go and say my sins in the privacy of companionship only with the priest and have the priest offer me absolution. The Protestant ideal is saying you're in a personal relationship. You have direct access. You don't have to go through the priest. And so we have this general confession model that we exercise every Sunday. We receive absolution. We believe that to be the same absolution that's offered in private confession and to have the same effect. But every now and then, there's one of those things that you just can't get past. There's one of those old guilts that you're carrying around, like a suitcase behind you with bricks in it. And sometimes you need to have the ability to look another human being in the eye and say, here's the terrible thing that I did. And I have the courage to say that I did it. And then to have that holy priest look you back in the eye and say, that's within the bounds of what Christ went to the cross for. God loves you despite that. And God offers to separate you from that. Most of the confessions that I have heard have had to do with relationship issues people who are coming out of a relationship or looking to clean house before they go into a relationship and need to leave some of that stuff behind. 
It's not, it's not usual for someone to come in and say, oh, I just killed somebody and I want forgiveness of that. The far more usual is I really hurt somebody and I don't know quite how to make it right. Or better still, I hurt somebody. I've said I'm sorry. The relationship hasn't healed, but I need to let the guilt go. Yeah, the uh, prayer book's language, again, those little italic words that tell us how to do it, says the... Um, forgotten what the first words are, but like the sanctity of the confessional is, this part's right, morally absolute. And it's very strange for the Anglican church to say that something is morally absolute. Moral absolutes run away from you like, like jello sliding across a slippery counter. Um, but for that one, the sanctity of the confessional is morally absolute. The idea is that when you are confessing your sin to the priest, you are confessing your sin to God, and we are the hollow vessel through which God is doing that work. Um, and what I'll tell you, having heard maybe maybe a dozen confessions in nine years of ordained ministry, uh, you forget. There's this, this blissful, holy forgetfulness um, that is unlike any other experience that I've had, that I can sort of remember the themes, but I really can't remember the stuff. And I'm so grateful for that. Um, and you should know that that happens too, that we are there to say this is within the bounds and then to offer you God's forgiveness and to invite you to leave that baggage behind. And that, all, that is available to you. Some, all may, none must, some should. So if you want to debate whether there are five sacraments or seven sacraments, Father Jonathan is available after the class. <laughs> However, remember back all the way to the middle part of session three, which was like 10 days ago. You remember when we had the picture of Henry Tudor up here and I said that the Pope had made him defender of the faith, right? Remember that? And that he used that title, defender of the faith, to justify the formation of a new church, right? You remember that I told you then I would come back to it and tell you later why he was made defender of the faith? He wrote a book arguing for seven sacraments. And because of that, the Pope named him defender of the faith because he was willing to stand up against those who would dismiss the lesser five. And if you hear the queen herself introduced to this day, her formal title is Elizabeth Regina II, by the grace of God, Queen of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, the head of the Commonwealth, the defender of the faith. I covered a lot of ground today. Get to know your prayer book. All right, you got to imagine with me in your mind because I don't have an easel in front of me. Imagine with me in your mind. Plato. Remember Plato, we like Plato, not Plato, but Plato, tells us, you'll have, you'll have small children at home, you went to Plato, I'm thinking, you know, Republic and all of that, yes. Plato gives us the idea, the idea of ideals and accidents, right? This is a chair. I know that it's a chair because I know what the ideal of a chair is, and this particular chair, this accident is this. But if I were to bring uh, another chair over, we don't have any other chairs. Plato would say there is an ideal of a chair. There is an essence of what a chair is. And this is one representation of that. And so there's a little dotted line in your brain between the essence of chair and this accident, this individual chair. And you know that this is a chair because there is a line between this object and the ideal in your brain. You all remembering back to freshman year philosophy class? Yeah, and Lee, you're not liking it. You're not, go, you're not liking it. Okay, so we got the ideal up here, we got the accident down here, we got a line drawn between us. Now, assume that I took bread and wine in my hand. And you know that it's bread and wine because there's a little line drawn between the thing that I have and the thing that I have and the ideal, right? Our youth group, just before we moved out of uh, Blaisdell and Greenwood, were having this exact conversation when they argued whether a Pop-Tart was ravioli. They were trying to figure out, they didn't know what they were doing, but they were trying to figure out what ideal the Pop-Tart connected to. And they thought 
it was connected to ravioli. Interestingly enough, when we said goodbye to those buildings, many of the youth wrote about this on the wall when we invited them to write on the wall. And most of those inscriptions have stayed. There's wallboard going up in front of them, but 100 years from now, when someone takes down this renovation that we've just built, uh, they're going to say, is a Pop-Tart ravioli? What is a Pop-Tart? How does this work? <laughs> you know, all that. So we got the chair, we got the ideal, we got the accident, we got a line in between them. I take bread and wine in my hand. You know it's bread, and I'm just going to do the bread side. It all works on the wine side too. You know it's bread because there's a line between the ideal of bread and the ideal and the accident that's in my hand. What the Roman Catholics would say in transubstantiation is that when the priest blesses that, he erases the line that exists between this object and the ideal of bread and redraws a line that exists between this object and the ideal of flesh. You go across the substance, through the substance, and hook up to another ideal. That's how the Roman Catholics make that argument. The Protestants on the other side, and by the by, you all know the, the um, magic words? Hocus pocus, right? It's not just putting your hands out and saying hocus pocus. It's putting your hands out and saying in the words of the Latin mass, hoc es corpus, this is the body. So the priest literally in the Latin mass puts his hands out, says the magic words, hoc es corpus, say that pretty fast, you get to hocus pocus, you take your hands off and it's no longer bread, it's flesh, boom! That's where it comes from. That's the truth. And you redraw that line up to a different ideal. Okay? That's transubstantiation. It's no longer bread and wine because we've hooked it up to another ideal. Consubstantiation. Consubstantiation. Think about con alongside. It's bread and wine. And it's coming alongside the idea that we're attaching to it that it's something holy. It is bread. It is wine. It will remain bread and it will remain wine. But we have done something to it that kind of makes it special. Not surprisingly, the Anglicans accept neither of these. We don't think that it changes into flesh, nor do we think that it's just bread and wine that comes alongside an ideal. We hold a middle ground. You'll get used to that. We hold a middle ground, and we call it the real presence. This is the real representation of God to us. This is the place we believe that God has chosen to dwell and he's chosen, we believe that he's chosen that because he told us, do this in remembrance of me. When you want to remember me, do this. And so we go through the same liturgical practice that the Roman Catholics do, and we say the same blessings, and we acknowledge that it's special. And we're going to take care of it specially because it's special. We're not going to throw it away. We're not going to let it fall on the floor. We're not just going to put it in a Ziploc bag in the closet. We're going to have a place of reverence to store the sacrament. We're going to teach people about the sacrament. We're going to believe it to be a sacrament. But we're not going to believe that it is now actually flesh and blood. We believe that it is to us the real presence of Christ. God is present to us always, but he told us, when you're having trouble finding me, you're going to find me at the holy table. Um, it's a tabernacle if it's kind of behind the altar, and it's called an ombre if it's in the wall. Ours is in the wall. You can see it. It's on the right-hand side of the altar from the congregational perspective. It's got a little bronze door on it, brass door on it, and um, a candle there marking the presence of Christ. All right, we got one more to go. We got one more to go, and it's on polity, making decisions in the community of faith. And if you've just rolled your eyes at me, <laughs> we got a problem. Come on back. This is our particular idea of how bishops, priests, and deacons, and lay people all interact with each other, the roles and responsibilities of each how each are chosen. Uh, it's going to get us ready. We're getting a new bishop in this diocese on May the 4th. We, it's been 18 years since we had a bishop's consecration, so you're really going to want to come, and we'll have a better understanding than everybody else in the room because you come to my class next Wednesday afternoon, Wednesday evening. I'll see you next week. Thank you all so much.